Rwanda's financial sector has made great strides towards becoming modern. The sector is stable, well capitalized, profitable and liquid. But all this has been made possible through a clear vision, through leveraging on the power of connectivity. 96.7% of Rwanda's geographic coverage is covered by 4G LTE services, while the population coverage of 96.6% enjoys 4G LTE services. The country has an 81% mobile phone penetration, with over 11 million mobile payment subscribers recorded as at 2018. 89 government services are currently offered online, with 100% of health centers connected to the internet. This is Invest Rwanda with a focus of innovation in banking and finance. Rwanda's digitization journey um, started, uh, I must say, about 22 years ago when uh, we made the intentional or deliberate decision to put ICT uh, at the center of all our social economic development plans. And it started uh, with the reality or the realization of uh, the fact that we don't have uh, too much natural resources, we're a landlocked country and technology, innovation, ICTs were going to be key drivers uh, of social economic growth. And when we started that journey, our focus was how do we put in place the right institutional frameworks, uh, the right institutional reforms, institutions that were going to drive uh, the, our, our digital ambition, our ambition to become a digital economy. And that was also followed with uh, heavy public investments in uh, digital infrastructure, what we call the foundation or the core of the digital economy. And throughout the years of investing uh, in, a, in a digital infrastructure, that's where we laid out the uh, 2,300 kilometers of fiber connecting all districts and border points of the country. Um, we invested in building the National Data Center, investments in cybersecurity infrastructure, because we were making heavy investments in infrastructure, but we also needed to make investments in infrastructure that would safeguard these digital infrastructure investments and information assets that we were putting in place. And the journey has been one of uh, more than 20 years, as I said at the beginning. And today, where we are, we are now leveraging um, or, or, or are taking advantage of these investments that we've already made in digital infrastructure and skills to really empower the different sectors of the economy. Uh, and that's why ICT has been mainstreamed as an enabler across the different economy, uh, across the different sectors uh, of the economy. That's why you see a strong focus on how can we leverage digital technologies to drive quality and accessible education, uh, to drive productivity and food security, uh, to ensure you know renewable energy solutions, um, to help MSMEs in going digital and accessing various markets. And so ICT has continued to be a cross-cutting um, you know tool, but also an enabler for the different. Uh, uh, sectors and we continue to make investments whether it's in skills um, last mile connectivity because we believe based on the, um, the, the, the the progress that we've seen but also seeing where we are going as a country that technology will continue to be an enabler for the growth and development that we want to see but just what has been driving Rwanda's policy formulation around modernization of the country's financial sector so in terms of the drivers uh, for digital financial inclusion, uh, one of them is around uh, the availability of relevant uh, tools and content and, and, and applications. Today, we see uh, applications such as mobile money, uh, you know, savings applications that are really coming onto the market and we see a lot of use of that. But that wouldn't have been possible if it hadn't been for uh, the digital infrastructure that has already been put in place, where today we have more than 95% uh, 3G coverage that will enable uh, for services such as mobile money to be easily accessible uh, for our citizens. So one of the, the, the very first driver would be around digital infrastructure. The second one is around, um, you know, the, the 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 institutions or the corporates around that are able to leverage these digital technologies. Whether we're talking about banks, telecommunication companies, or startups in the fintech industry, that are using different sets of technology to respond uh, to how we can close on the gap of digital financial inclusion today. And today we take pride in, in knowing that uh, you have uh, over over ninety percent uh, financial inclusion that has been enabled. Uh, 
for, for our citizens using digital technologies. And this is from about 26.1% 10 years ago. And, and this is thanks to you know the use of technology and making sure that these financial services are easily accessible by our citizens, are easily accessible by everyone who, who will need them. The third driver for this is around the skills. And, and I think that also ties very well into the second one, which is the ecosystem, the industry. Uh, because without the skills, then you wouldn't be able to innovate and create all these solutions that make sense, that, are, that, that allow for meaningful use of, uh, of, these, uh, of these digital infrastructure investments. And so, and the, and the final one, which perhaps should also be the most important one, is having the right business policy and regulatory environment. Uh, for the fintech or, or for digital financial inclusion, because that, that will mean looking at policies that are going to allow for interoperability. Uh, last year in December, we launched uh, uh, together with RSwitch, the central bank, the Ministry of Finance, we, we were able to launch P2P in terms of mobile money. So if you're an Airtel uh, user, you're able to send money today to an MTN mobile money uh, subscriber. And the next use cases are going to be around where as an Airtel or an MTN mobile money user, you can send to a merchant of either Airtel or MTN. We're also now onboarding banks so that that can also happen from wallet to bank. And so interoperability and the policy around how do we make sure that these solutions are more interoperable, uh, ensuring that eventually as we finish digitizing the circles, that they can also be able to you know, send and receive money across the different other uh, financial service providers. And so it's really those policies and regulations and the business environment that allows uh, for this digital financial services industry to thrive. Over the last decade, Rwanda's financial sector has seen tremendous growth, expanding in leaps and bounds, with the mushrooming of an array of institutions like a stock exchange, banks, microfinance institutions, savings and credit cooperatives, insurance companies, and pension funds. The sector is becoming increasingly diversified. Financial institutions have played a significant role um, in our digitalization or digital economy agenda. And I'll give you practical examples. Uh, we're talking about today, um, you know, financial inclusion, but now thinking about financial inclusion enabled by digital platforms and digital technologies. All of that wouldn't be possible if these same financial institutions were not making the right investments in making sure that they are building the right technologies, the right platforms that allow to drive uh, financial inclusion. Uh, so that is one. Number two, when it comes to how these financial institutions are deploying uh, their services, there's an element of building digital literacy for our citizens. Because the more you provide services using digital tools and platforms, the more citizens or your customer base, uh, your subscriber base, which makes up our uh, population, is actually taking advantage uh, of those tools that you that you bring to them. So I must say that the financial industry has been one uh, that has been, uh, uh, you know, an advocate, but also a believer in, 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 in why digital is important, but also digital is what is going to you know, uh, drive their services closer to the citizens. Uh, the other aspect uh, around the role of uh, financial institutions is, is largely around, uh, beyond of course the financial services that they are providing, is also the ability to, um, to, to absorb or to you know, embark on how they can use these digital technologies. Uh, we have talked about the use of blockchain, the use of AI, how do you deliver better services, how do you ensure that you have citizen-centric services. And so knowing that every citizen, wherever they are in any part of this country, is going to, in one way or the other, need some financial services. What form of financial services and how do you ensure that they are targeted, they're citizen-centric, they are very inclusive, but also they are enabling and they empower these citizens. And so this has been one of the industries that has been really, uh, technology hasn't just been a game changer for the work that they do, but they've also been, uh, you know, they, they've helped us to preach to people and convert more people to understand the benefits uh, of uh, digital technologies. The Central Bank of Rwanda, through its regulatory role, has continued to be pivotal in Rwanda's journey towards building robust digital financial solutions that are not only secure, but also inclusive in nature. What really we have tried to do in the last, I would say, five to ten years is to ensure that one, our regulatory framework is robust enough to ensure financial stability. So we are happy that we haven't had any major financial institution failure 
in those instances. And when we've seen sectors that had problems, especially the microfinance, we've intervened and made sure that depositors are protected and hence uh, the deposit guarantee fund that was established. Secondly, to make sure that our regulatory framework is in line with international uh, best practices, especially by introducing these Basel reforms even in our own financial sector. So today, one, we have a robust regulatory framework. We do have a stable and sound financial sector, which is highly capitalized and has capital buffers to really resist to any shock. And thirdly, also looking at the development of the financial sector itself, where we've also introduced innovation or made sure that innovation is part of what we do by setting up a standalone financial sector development department within the central bank to look at innovation. And probably we can talk about it later on. What are the innovation in the financial sector and how do we make sure that our regulation can accommodate those innovations? So Rwanda's digital economy agenda is really about leaving no one behind and making sure that uh, every uh, citizen of Rwanda benefits in a meaningful way uh, from the investments that are being made or from the, uh, the benefits and the opportunities that the digital economy pro promises. And what does that mean? Uh, it means that starting from infrastructure, earlier I did talk about um, the investments that have been made in really just putting in place the backbone infrastructure. But right now, our biggest focus is how do we make sure that last mile connectivity is affordable and accessible for everyone? Uh, because without that, then you're still going to see so many people that are dependent on third, service, third party service providers uh, to be able to meaningfully benefit uh, from these uh, opportunities that the digital economy uh, presents to us. Um, the other thing in terms of the agenda is making sure that every Rwandan is digitally literate. Every citizen in Rwanda is digitally literate. Why is that important? Because that's the only way people can benefit uh, from these uh, from the digital economy. People will be able to you know, interact with the different platforms and tools in a way that creates value for them, in a way that creates wealth for them, and in a way that betters their lives uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so that, that's really important for us. And so that's really our digital transformation agenda, making sure that the, the use and integration of digital technologies in Rwanda is sustainable, but also is one that is inclusive to make sure that every Rwandan uh, is benefiting from these equally. Financial institutions like Bank of Kigali are already anchoring their operations on this agenda. The bank has continued to take major steps towards modern digital banking like establishing an innovation department that aims to transform the way banking technology is delivered, the Bank of Kigali Digital Factory. The Bank of Kigali Digital Factory was conceived in 2018 and started operating in 2019. Um, and the mandate or the vision was that it would be a center for innovation within the bank and the driver, the engine for the digitization of the Bank of Kigali. Um, an incubator for a new culture and exciting new um, banking capabilities. And of course, uh, we've evolved since then. Our mandate has, has um, adjusted, as the bank's strategy has as well, um, but we've achieved a lot since then. Rwanda aims to become a business and financial center of excellence. An international finance center is already in place. The journey for Rwanda Finance and Chigali International Financial Center has been focused on three critical pillars. One, a pillar that speaks to creating an enabling environment. We identified 23 laws that needed amendment, and as of today, we have 18 laws that have been enacted. These laws are critically important. Not only are they founded on common law principles, but they also speak to economic substance because we want to see Chigali International Financial Center making direct impact on the general economy in terms of attracting capital, in terms of creating opportunities, in terms of diversifying the financial sector. So that, 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 that's part of what, part one of what we've been doing. Part two of what we've been doing is creating tax incentives that are very important to attract further incentives. And these tax incentives are highlighted within the investment promotion and facilitation law. We've also been working around expanding 
bilateral agreements between Rwanda and, and, and other countries. And this more speaks to double tax treaties, where today we have 11 treaties in force, around 14 that are in negotiation. Some have been concluded, others are at different stages of negotiation. And then the other pillar that is also critically important speaks to skills and capacity building. As we look to diversify, as we look to attract further investments within our financial sector, we also need to ensure that we have the skills that are able to serve different investor needs. So we've been working with different stakeholders from the National Bank of Rwanda to the Rwanda Development Board, Capital Markets Authority, Rwanda Stock Exchange, and others on how we can build, upskill, attract further skills within our financial sector. And then lastly, which is also critically important, is now in terms of investor attraction. Today we have a pipeline of onboarded investors above 70. We have, are now speaking to diversification, we are seeing holding companies that are domiciling in Chigali International Financial Center to consolidate their African camp operations. We are seeing fintechs that are setting up in Chigali International Financial Center. We are seeing fund structures, we are seeing foundations that are coming to Rwanda and domiciling under Chigali International Financial Center. So that's the progress over the last close to three years of what we've been able to do. With a solid growth strategy, the Kigali International Finance Center is determined to ensure Rwanda achieves its financial hub potential. The financial sector is, is agile. It calls for agility. We are continuing to improve and creating an enabling environment. Now, with that in place, we're already seeing different structures that bring capital within our country. A case in point is NOSCAN, which is creating the largest incubation in Africa. Not only is it attracting African entrepreneurs, but it's also giving them a platform to meet with investors. So that's one. Two, we're also seeing emergence and domiciliation of, of fund structures that have a focus on fintech. A case in point is Virunga Fund One. It's uh, the fund for export development and promotion promoted by Africa Zim Bank, and we are seeing more. So that's how Chigali International Financial Center is beginning and already contributes to Rwanda's process of digitalization, but most importantly with a focus around fintech. Now, we continue to work with other stakeholders, such as the Minister of ICT, as well as the National Bank of Rwanda, to develop our regulatory policy. We already have a robust sandbox regulation, but we are look, we've now finalized our fintech strategy, and we are now discussing implementation. And that's what we are, how we are looking to contribute. And finally, it's around also attracting skills and leveraging the skills that are already in place. The Bank of Kigali and the digital factory specifically plays a very big role in the development of, of Rwanda's digital economy and economy at large. Um, first, we're here to provide financial solutions. This is digital infrastructure, right? It, it's what underpins our commerce. It's what underpins um, investments. Someone wants to bring money into the country. They want to be able to send it out. They want to be able to manage it. Uh, the better our platforms, so mobile, internet banking, etc., the easier it is and the more comfortable people feel um, domiciling their money here and then working uh, with that money here. Um, apart from delivering financial services, uh, we're developing people, uh, which is what drives the growth of any digital economy. Um, we employ some of the best and some of the youngest uh, talented Rwandans, and we ensure that they are challenged and get exposed to world-class standards, uh, world-class uh, teams, world-class projects, and then they are able to participate in the development of all of these top class um, financial solutions, digital financial solutions that we've been working on. Um, and in doing that, we pollinate the Rwandan space, right? Uh, we raise the standards. Um, we show people that it's possible. Um, and beyond that, should some of these talented young men uh, or women 
um, decide to leave the digital factory. I am sure that wherever they land, they're going to help them raise uh, their game um, and be even more productive. Our priorities as a regulator in uh, as much as we want to push for more digital financial services is also to make sure that the infrastructure underpinning it is secure and the transactions are also secure. Hence, one of our priority is really building cyber resilience, not only as a central bank, but also making sure that all financial institutions that we regulate have a robust cybersecurity and risk management uh, that are tied to, to cyber or the risk of cyber attack. The second that we've seen that is an emerging risk is the protection of data. As you know, Rwanda has uh, put in place last year uh, personal data and privacy protection law, and we have to make sure that our financial institutions with the data that they collect, store and process are abiding by uh, that regulation. Uh, secondly, it's also, you know, I think a prerequisite to continue building trust in, in, in the financial sector, you can imagine if, um, you know, God forbid we were to have a financial institution that is a victim to, you know, cyber attack or that has data that's being misused, then the trust that we've built into our own financial system would be undermined. Um, and then the last point is really to ensure that uh, you know, whatever digital um, innovation or technology innovation that's being introduced in our financial system is not excluding, uh, you know, a portion of our population. One can look at, for instance, if there was a product that's only offered to people who can afford a smartphone, we would be excluding, you know, a portion of our population who doesn't uh, you know, have, have, have smartphones as of yet. So we have to make sure that products that are digitalized can be accessed as widely as possible. Rwanda is already attracting large-scale investment opportunities in new and upcoming sectors, including green and sustainable financing and fintech. SPAN is one of such fintech companies. Rwanda is a very interesting market, but also not only being interesting for investors. The government of Rwanda is very welcome for foreign direct investment, um, us also being part of that. The government of Rwanda has invested heavily into making sure that we have, uh, as investors, a very good ecosystem. They have made investment in very good um, infrastructure that allows us tech, fintech companies, be able to transact, but also we have a very interesting and innovative uh, partner, IADM Bank, and the central bank that is very willing to help the companies go cashless and also digitize the whole country. And for that, we find the market of Rwanda being very uh, open for us, but also see the future of growing as uh, the initiatives of the country uh, lead to what we believe into. I can give you one example. Um, if you look at the new initiative driven by the central bank in partnership of, uh, with the um, ICT chamber of the sandbox, that's one of the things you can't easily see in other markets. And it makes us not only that we're interested in the market in the beginning, but also us be more interested in uh, keep investing uh, in Rwanda as a market. So having a sandbox in place where any innovator, you know, uh, but we have criteria, we cannot accept everyone, can go through that process where we also as a regulator learn about the technology, the product, and also be able to challenge ourselves on are the regulations in place really, um, you know, uh, uh, facilitating that product, especially if it's a product that's solving issues on access, quality of services, or affordability of those services. So we think really the regulatory sandbox, which has been put in place uh, this year since April, will help a long way to, to really facilitate those startups in the financial services to be able to offer their services by having not only been educated on the constraints or requirements 
uh, to be able to offer financial services. As you know, the financial sector is one of the most regulated sectors, but, but it's, it's done in a way that we know people are really using either the citizens' uh, savings, uh, you know, we don't want people losing their deposits because they are now depositing with, with a fintech or a young startup. And we need to really make sure that whatever innovation is coming to the financial sector is not uh, sort of a cause of instability to our financial sector. So that striking that balance through a regulatory sandbox where for 12 months, you know, the, the, the startup can um, test or pilot their products is one of the ways that we think we're facilitating innovation in the financial sector. And as Rwanda looks towards becoming a business and financial center of excellence in the region, industry partnerships will remain key. So in, in brief, what, what do I see in 20 years? I see maybe 20 years is too, too long. Maybe what do I see in 10 years? I see a connected society. We want to see an increase of savings so that we not only have a thriving or thriving banking sector, but also our capital markets that would facilitate, you know, the um, funding of long term projects that our country needs. I, I see a society that is, uh, you know, highly empowered, that is fully digitized. I see a society where you can't tell the difference between someone who's living in the rural parts of the country and the urban parts of, 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 of Rwanda, because we ho all have the same tools and, and, and platforms and we, are, we can all equally access them in the same manner.